it's Michael over again. Uh, this is the second lecture on orgs and crake um, for my, again, for English 102 at Shoreline Community College in Seattle. But again, welcome for anybody who uh, is trying to make more sense of orgs and crake by Margaret Atwood. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to start um, with chapter three um, and try and do chapter three and chapter four, um, maybe get to chapter five, depending on time. So. <clears throat> Chapter three starts with the section Nooners, uh, and this section covers a lot of ground. Um, we get the feeling of heat and humidity that emerges in the mid-afternoon. Um, we also learn a little bit about the beginning of the apocalypse, um, or at least for Snowman, when he, when he did have a knife and he had a lean-to. Um, so we know a little bit about how long he's actually been in this post-apocalyptic post world. We learn a bit about his ineptitude. His father never really thought that he was that handy. Uh, Snowman mulls over some memories uh, and make-believe, which leads him to thinking of Oryx and her ambiguous someone else, which again leads to her the mystery that surrounds her. We also get uh, the idea of games, pretend, uh, in particular pretending and make-believe. Most importantly in this chapter, I think, is the reference to the caterpillar, uh, something that presents Snowman with a sense of beauty. Um, and we have actually another literary reference here, something that Snowman can't quite identify, um, but something that does come to his mind. And, and this time it's a, a hymn by a preacher named Babcock, um, and it, it's the line that goes, quote, We are not here to play, to dream, to drift. We have hard work to do and loads to lift. The sense of purpose uh, here is exactly what he doesn't have. In fact, he has been dreaming and drifting, and that's really all that he has. Um, once again, we have more of an insight into who he is as a person and who he was before the apocalypse, um, and this will kind of play out as the, the story goes forward, um, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, there's an irony as well hopelessness and a reference to the movie On the Waterfront, which some of you may have seen that the line, I could have been a contender. Uh, the thought that he might have been someone, that he might have had a future had there only been more time. Finally, yet another reference to recording history and isolation. Um, uh, Snowman muses, uh, quote, even a castaway assumes a future reader, someone who will come along later and find his bones and his ledger and learn his fate. Uh, so on page one, uh, on page 41, sorry, um, every reader that he can imagine is in the past. Again, this idea of uh, being alone, not being able to communicate, not having anybody to communicate with, um, which again sort of sets him apart from the Krakers. Uh, the short section that follows is called Downpour. And this short section seems to give us a little bit more sense of the environment uh, in which Snowman is placed. Uh, there's sort of changing mercurial weather. Um, we have another bit of sense of memory. But again, most importantly, I think here is his sense of guilt and some indication of his role, perhaps, in the apocalypse. Uh, on page uh, 45, he says, I didn't do it on purpose. Uh, he says, in the sniveling child's voice, he reverts to, in this mood, things happened. I had no idea. It was out of my control. What could I have done? Just someone, anyone, listen to me, please. What a bad performance. Even he isn't convinced by it. So that, again, he's trying to connect. He wants to connect with somebody he has nobody to connect with. Um, but also the sense of guilt. Um, and there's really no one to hear his confession. Uh, so moving on, we get to uh, chapter four, which begins with Rakonk, uh, which uh, we discussed in class, or at least one group discussed in class today. Uh, the title of this section comes from the genetically engineered raconk, which is part raccoon and part skunk. And, and we learned that this was made as, quote, an after-hours hobby, one of the odd combinations um, and uh, of things that are made at, uh, at the compound, right? So again, this sort of lack of ethics and, and um, splicing things just for giggles um, for no other real reason than they can. Um, so... Uh, it's also one of the things, it's one of his father's half-assed attempts at connecting with his son. And this is a, the raconk is a birthday present, um, and he sort of says that he had to pull a lot of strings to get the raconk. Um, and it builds more upon uh, his poor relationship with his parents. 
Not long after he's given the rack, they ask him what he's going to name it. And his mother knows him well enough to say, you're probably going to name it Bandit. And um, Jimmy says, no, I wasn't, although he was going to. Um, he instead names it this rat hunk killer. Um, in the meantime, his dad changes jobs and ends up at Healthwiser. Uh, security here is even higher than it was at Oregon Inc. Uh, he gains some independence, that is, Jimmy gains some independence, and discovers Alex the Parrot, a character based on a real study done uh, on a parrot that was able to recognize shapes and colors. And again, importantly for our uh, class, you know, what does this say about what makes us human, the nature of humanity? Because here's a creature that can talk, that can reason, um, that can identify shapes and colors. Um, so it kind of blurs the line, right? Um, and if you were in class today, we started with um, a short video of Alex Parrot, but you can look them up on, on YouTube and find various videos on uh, Alex the Parrot. Uh, here we have many, uh, you know, again, it's one of those references to many things that exist in the real world. Um, we overhear a brief argument between his parents that uh, sort of indicates the reason that his mother gave up science was because of her ethics and her morals and what they're doing, um, you know, genetic splicing and all those things it sort of violates her ethics and she thinks it's wrong. Um, you know, sort of, we can assume it has to do with the predatory nature of companies, a sort of... Uh, false hope or selling of indulgences for those of you that, that remember your history that um, at one point in time that the church that uh, uh, sold these indulgences you could buy your way into heaven um, interestingly uh, last note on this is that we've moved to new skins which might be a commentary on the old sauce or beauty is only skin deep right uh, okay the next section hammer so several years pass Probably as a plea for the intention he's in getting at home, Jimmy invents righteous mom and evil dad. Um, again, righteousness this has to do with his mom's sort of view of ethics and evilness. Maybe his dad blurring the line ethically. Um, it becomes kind of a lunchtime spectacle and a way for Jimmy to get some of the attention that he isn't getting at home. Rather abruptly, Jimmy's mom, Sharon, uh, leaves and takes Killer with her. The note itself is, is full of emptiness with blah, blah, blahs, uh, which seem to speak to Jimmy's own emotional um, disconnection. Right? He never really had this good connection with his mother. Um, in fact, he's even uncertain as to whether he is more saddened by the loss of his mother or by a killer. So, you know, if we're putting those two things in juxtaposition, um, it kind of tells us something a little bit about his relationship. I and mean, killer is really the only creature that he is connected with, right, that he, he feels he can talk to. Um, we also find out that his mother has destroyed all the computers in the house, which we can assume is probably out of guilt or out of this sort of blurring of the line of ethics. Um, and, and somebody in class raised a question, well, what does that tell us? What, what, um, what, why did, what did she destroy? Why did she destroy it? What did she see or what did she find, right? Um, and we also find out how carefully she planned her escape. Right? And Jimmy is questioned by corpse to corpse. Nostalgia comes up again on page 63, uh, and this time, to a reference before the compounds and the plebo. So it's actually not Jimmy's sense of nostalgia, it's a sense of nostalgia of the culture. Um, after Jimmy's mom leaves, Ramona, his dad's old assistant, who you'll remember came with them from Oregon Inc., moves in and eventually becomes his stepmom. She's attentive and friendly, but Jimmy is already jaded and has trouble accepting this relationship. Uh, he holds her at a distance. He blames Ramona and his father for the disappearance of his mother, or at least we can infer so much from uh, page 67. Uh, Jimmy starts to get postcards from Aunt Monica, who he knows is his mother, but doesn't bother to tell Corpse Corpse. Um, it's an interesting choice here, too, because uh, we know of inter from the interviews with Margaret Atwood that um, uh, her sort of awareness and use of biblical ideas and references. And so I would suggest that this is probably a reference to Monica of Hippo, who was the mother of St. Augustine, who again was referenced in the Wasteland. Pious, faithful woman uh, who was dedicated to her son. Um, and again, her son became uh, St. Augustine. Uh, there is some reference to some of the, in some of the online material that uh, she uh, had an adulterous marriage. I don't know if that's really verifiable or like you know, there's enough information there to go on, but she definitely was married to uh, an abusive husband. So um, 
abusive maybe in this case is actually not necessarily physically abusive, but um, sort of emotionally distant. It's not the best relationship. Um, at the end of this cha chapter, we get another sense of mantras and snowman's reminder to himself to, quote, hang on to words, because once they're out of his head, they'll be gone forever. So it's as if he's holding on to some vestige of the past. He sees himself as the last man on earth. He's a dying breed. Um, with him dies all of human history, culture, and language that, that homo, homo sapiens sapiens created. Uh, okay, onwards to Crake. So Crake uh, is obviously aptly named because in this section we're introduced to Crake as a character. Crake appears just before Jimmy's mom disappears, which gives us the unique exterior observation, uh, Jimmy's mother's observation of Crake. Um, that Craig is, in her words, intellectually honorable, that he doesn't lie to himself. Um, we learn that his real name is Glenn, and that he's named after a musician, which uh, is interesting in that the actual musician is probably Canadian pianist Glenn Gould, uh, who did have a reputation for being something of a genius, had quirks such as wearing uh, warm clothing all year round, and of course, Craig's quirk is that he wears sort of nondescript clothing all year round. Um, Gould also had sort of a penchant for alter egos, so that we kind of get that in the duality of Glenn and Craig. Glenn will soon and forever afterwards in the book be uh, Craig, and Snowman notes that Glenn was, quote, only a disguise. And uh, it's really Craig that will serve as a counterpoint to Jimmy, uh, as one of two major counterpoints to Jimmy slash Snowman's perspective. After all, uh, it's Crick that notes, quote, not everything has a point. Um, uh, so we also learn here again, sort of at the end, that uh, the climate has shifted because it's bright and sunny in October, which I think is uh, one of these indications that uh, of global warming. Okay, we'll get through brain frizz, and then um, if we don't get through hot the hot tot section, um, I'll pick it up in the next uh, video lecture. So. Brain frizz, uh, reference to an online site where I believe, um, you can double check this, I might be wrong, just going off the top of my head, they can watch um, live executions. Um, so again, this idea that everything, the, the sort of the internet is a wild west, it's kind of a modern, uh, modern day Sodom and Gomorrah, everything's available, everything's for sale. So we get another reference to chess uh, as a game, again you can parallel that with the wasteland. Uh, we learn even more about Craig's intelligence and ability. We learn that he, quote, was very smart even in the world of Healthwiser High with its overstock of borderline geniuses and polymaths. So the, he's smart even among the smartest. He has a clear knack for biotechnology which fits with the current society and will help us begin to put together some of the pieces of what happened on, on the trajectory and where the Craigers came from. The boys play a lot of games, um, among them Blood and Roses, you know, trading the good things of humanity for the ills, right? Um, so just kind of going from, from one thing to another. Um, and it's sort of uh, this rush towards either survival of humanity or destruction, right? Ditto, ditto with barbarian stomp, which is this idea of placing one culture in opposition against another culture. Um, <clears throat> it's on page 80 that we finally, that they finally discover Extinctathon monitored, monitored by Mad Adam. Uh, so clear biblical reference there, and this game will really set up the rest of the story. Craig becomes fixated on this game, as he is with many others, but he seems uniquely suited to this game. He, he has a passion for it, and, and maybe even wants to become a grandmaster. Um, in here, the, you know, as we kind of talked about already, this proliferation of websites where they can watch anything, um, you know, sets up the lack of morals in the society. Everything's for sale. Everything's possible. Um, and the sort of capitalization of society. Uh, most Im interestingly, I think, uh, we get another literary reference here, actually kind of two literary references linked together. Uh, so on page 84, they come across At Home with Anna Kay, which doesn't appeal to Craig, but is fascinating to Jimmy. And here I'd contend that Anna Kay's name is a clear reference to Leo Tolstoy, Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina, a story which does deal with... Um, hypocrisy and jealousy um, and the difference of civilization and, and a sort of connection to the land. Uh, of course, one of the things that Jimmy fixates on here uh, is his first encounter with Shakespeare 
through Anna's case, Anna Kay's sight as she sits on the toilet reading from Macbeth, which, surprise, this seems to have something to do with the apocalypse and guilt. Tomorrow, tomorrow, and tomorrow. This will be an additional sort of separation between Jimmy as a word guy and Craig as a numbers guy, right? So this sort of, again, sort of idea that even in this world, uh, Jimmy is an outsider. <clears throat> All right, so let's actually, I think we got time to get through Hot Talk. So um, probably not a surprise that in the same overall chapter that we meet Craig, we have our first introduction to Oryx. We don't actually meet her. <clears throat> and it's not at the same time direct meeting as Jimmy and Craig, but rather a discovery. Um, and it's somewhat ironic, I think, that the, the section begins with a reference to Craig's mother's belief in um, child, a belief in a child's privacy, um, and then goes on to reveal that the boys, in fact, have stumbled across a child pornography site. Uh, nostalgia is mentioned again on page 89 as Jimmy thinks about the routine that they're in that already seems like something from the past. Um, we get more references to everything having a price. We get a reference to Gulliver's Travels, uh, which we saw in the epigraph. Uh, this time a reference to the Little Pushins. I don't think this is the last time we're going to see a reference to Gulliver's Travels, so we'll, we'll still keep it kind of on, uh, on the radar. Uh, Jimmy is shocked uh, by what he views as Oryx looking directly into his soul, or like looking right directly at him. Um, and it says, quote, Jimmy felt burned by this look, eaten into as if by acid. He tries to play it off. Craig seems to have been impacted uh, far less, um, although he does pause the frame and print out a copy of the picture as a souvenir, even though he admits it's a little bit risky and may end up getting them caught by Uncle Pete, whose account they have stolen in order to uh, surf the darker parts of the net. The section ends with Jimmy remembering a conversation that ends with Oryx commenting, quote, you want to know everything. Jimmy does want to know everything about Oryx, um, and it, it will become a kind of obsession. Um, and although it's a little bit of reach, we might see it as some sort of reference to the Tree of Knowledge of the, in the Bible, or even a reference to Dr. Faustus, which is an eponymous uh, play by uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, in which the good doctor makes a deal with the devil in exchange for knowledge. Again, I think that might be a little bit of a stretch, but it's a possibility. Uh, okay, so we'll end there. Um, so lecture three, we'll start with chapter five. Um, I hope that helps make a little bit more sense. Uh, I know for those of you that were, again, in class, we talked about it a lot today, but we only really talked about whatever section to your group was assigned. So. Um, Again, if you have questions, comments, uh, leave them below um, and I'll do my best to answer them.